everyone for being here today. Uh, my name is Jeff Cote with Pacific Yacht Systems and uh, today's presentation is going to be Explore the World of Garmin. But to be honest, I was talking a little bit earlier, if I did everything Garmin and just Marine, it'd be an eight hour lecture. And I'm not joking, we'd briefly talk about all the products. Garmin is, has a massive selection of product and what I'm going to be talking about today is Garmin Marine and the highlights or what I decided to put there, the popular models. Honestly, there is so much choice, it can be overwhelming. So what my purpose here today is to make sense of it all for you, yourselves so that you can make a decision for your boat. With that, we're going to get started. When we tackle navigation systems, I always take this approach, and I'm not kidding, I think like in anything in life, you've got to start with a plan. And as an engineer, I think it's very important to not just do anything in life, but to kind of do your homework up front, kind of make all your sort of criterias at the beginning, your requirements, and then apply those requirements to what you're going to do, think of what you're going to do, and then do it. The doing part is the easy part. The hard part is thinking what you're actually going to do. Uh, I'm owner operator of Pacific Yacht Systems. Some of you know me, some of you don't. Um, it's my life's work to actually work on boats. I work on boats, I think about boats, I dream about boats, and then I vacation on boats. That's all I do. I don't have any other hobbies. I'm a non-recovering boat alcoholic. Uh, and today I hope you're going to sense that passion that I have and navigation systems are a way for you to get safely from A to B. And that's what we're going to be talking about. The other thing too, some of you might like to geek out. I use that expression. Um, I write two monthly columns, one now in Pacific Yachting for about eight years. And we started doing Northwest Yachting. And Northwest Yachting, by the way, is just electronics. It's hot wire, so we're publishing every month a new article about technical stuff about navigation systems. So if you're curious, we've got all those articles on our website as PDF and HTMLs. So you can go back and even though you don't have a subscription to either of the magazines, you can see our content on our website. Furthermore, some of you might be curious and this might not be enough for you. For some of you, it might be too much information. Uh, if you're curious and you want to geek out, we've got over 150 videos and we're approaching about 500,000 hits on YouTube for views. So it seems to resonate with some of us, okay? Uh, I'm a boat owner. I was asked in Seattle, we were doing sort of a presentation, like, are you a boater? Like, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm a boater. I got a 36-foot sailboat. I love her. She's awesome. Uh, amazing. Giving me a lot of joy. A lot of joys. So our business is specialized in two things. We do expertise through repetition. And one of those things that we're going to be talking about today is electronics. We do mostly our work in British Columbia. I mean, we've flown, have done work in, I had guys living in Mexico for a year, working on a sunken boat for over a year, and we've been in Venezuela, we've been everywhere, but most of it is here in British Columbia. I was in Saskatchewan just before Christmas, so that's kind of odd, but you know, sometimes we fly out, there are boaters outside of British Columbia. And what I'm going to be sharing with you today is last year alone, we did about a thousand boats. <clears throat> so my knowledge is not, I never make any, it's about experience. You know, you need to live something to learn something. And I learn from my own mistakes and other people's mistakes because I get called on to other boats that have problems. And we always learn. And that collective learning is what I'm going to be sharing with you today. Last year alone, we did about 150 navigation systems for Garmin. So we did large boats, small boats, everything in between. So one system had seven screens and some systems just have one. So it doesn't matter. There's a system for you out there with Garmin. So with that, we're going to get started. So the first thing I want to say, and this is really important, there's no such thing as a perfect system for every boater. Unfortunately, there is no one size fits all for all of us. So please don't be tempted to replicate what you see your neighbor do or a fellow boater do. It's very important to do something for you as a boater. There's no such thing as, oh, this is the system you want and I haven't met you. You have to start thinking about how to use your boat, where are you going with your boat, what's your horizon with your boat, and also realize that it's not about tearing everything out. It's very, very rare for me to come on a boat and say we're going to rip all of it out and start fresh. Even on some jobs that are ridiculous, hundreds and hundreds of hours, 
we're going to integrate something that's on the boat and we're actually going to use maybe an autopilot. Maybe we'll use the existing VHFs. It's not about doing everything, right? So keep what's good and start getting in the direction of something that you really need that might be new, right? But it doesn't have to be everything all at once. It really doesn't. The other question that you have to start thinking about is are you going to go with dedicated displays, right? Are you going to have one display that does it all? Even though displays now are multifunction, and we'll talk about that, you might on your boat say, you know what, Jeff, I'd like to rather have two 12 inch displays and have one for radar, one for chart plotter. If I lose one, then I don't have all my eggs in one basket. Some other boaters say, Jeff, I want the biggest wow screen you can get. I want a 24 inch and I want all my eggs in one basket. I want just one screen at the helm. That's all I want. And it's not say one is right or one is wrong. It's about what do you want on your boat. There's pros and cons to every single decision you're going to do. And that's the reality. And the other thing too that we're going to be talking about, and this is a big one, as a boater, you have to ask yourself, am I going to have a touch screen or a screen that I'm going to interface with buttons? Right? It really depends what type of boater. Remember that there's no such thing as truly touch. The screens actually are sensing some sort of resistance to your hand, which is predominantly moisture. So in the wintertime, when we boat in the wintertime, and I've spent two weeks at Desolation at Christmas, last year two weeks in the Gulf Islands, Touch screens won't work. You know, your iPhone's not going to work if it's very cold. You're going to need a special glove that's got a sort of resistance on it that to operate. So if you're boating a lot in the wintertime or in the fall or you're a sailor and you're in heavy seas, maybe touch screen is not right for you, right? But touch screen is really also very intuitive, right? Most people now just simply go to the screen. So it depends what you're looking. Are you going to be inside the boat, outside the boat? So those are variables that you have to take into consideration when you're deciding. And remember, a touchscreen is more money, definitely more money than a screen of the same size with buttons. You're paying a premium for that interface via touch. With that, we're going to get, I want to talk about one last thing. Also, when, remember this, and this is a big takeaway. New is not always better. There's something to be said for something being tested and proven. And the other thing, too, that I remind people is your electronics purchase is going to be between 10 and 15 to probably 20 years. Don't chase the latest and greatest. Because soon enough, you're going to have something that is not the latest and greatest anymore. So don't bother, right? It's, it's not something you need to chase. Because otherwise, you'd be changing your electronics every two, three years. And nobody does that, right? The shortest span I see for electronics is 10. And that's pretty rare. Most people, it's 15. And sometimes up to 20, 30 years. Right? So it's a long-term investment. So choose something that is not greatest at the expense of reliability. That's very important. Reliability has to come first for navigation equipment, more than features. Here today I'm talking about Garmin. Not to say that we only do Garmin. I'll do Furuno, I'll do BNG, we'll do different systems, Simrad. The question is every brand has its different advantages. And so today what I'm talking to you about is the advantages of Garmin. It's not to say it's the best. It's for you to decide what works for you. Some owners love Furuno. You might love Raymarine. It doesn't matter. Here what I'm going to be talking about is why would I recommend Garmin. And the question for everyone here in the audience is see if that resonates with you, right? Does the Garmin, what Garmin offers, the Garmin product, does it resonate with what you want for electronics on your boat? So first and foremost, when we're making suggestions on electronics for boaters, I ask a boater, are you a geek and do you like reading manuals and tweaking and figuring everything out and really spending a lot of time tweaking your navigation system? If you're that type of owner, Garmin is probably not for you. Garmin is something sort of like an iPhone. An iPhone is a long time not the best phone out there. But what's great about an iPhone compared to an Android phone is it's simple to use. So if you're a boater that wants to simply use your equipment, and you don't want to have a manual that's half an inch thick beside you, and you don't want to be constantly tweaking everything, and you just want to use it, then Garmin is a really good contender. Pacific Yacht Systems is also an authorized Garmin Marine Service Center. That means that warranties come to us. And I can tell you, seeing the underbelly, because I get the warranty calls, what I think is really impressive about Garmin is how reliable it is. 
The company comes from an aviation background, and in aviation, electronics are not a toy, they're not a gadget. That's how you navigate, right? You've got to trust your instruments. That culture permeates other things that Garmin do, including their navigation. So I think that's really important, is if you're going to spend all this time, all this money, putting into money into a navigation system, what I like about Garmin's approach is things work and they're reliable. It's to how I would describe it, it's not a marketing-led company. Marketing-led company is someone that simply pushes out products, it's glossy, it looks flash, and the engineers are putting their hands in the back, you can't do it, it's not ready, and the product manager is like, no, we're releasing today, because that's our timeline. And I think that's the culture that Garmin has, is releasing products that come out of the gate that work. And that's, I think, very important, especially considering the amount of money that you can spend in a navigation system. The other thing, too, that's really important is Garmin plays nice. What does that mean? Is Garmin does, what they do is they'll integrate with lots of different manufacturers. NMEA 2000, NME 103 is part of all their products. So they're backward compatible, which is really important because a lot of us are going to have VHF radios that are not NMEA 2000 compatible, but we still want to have a GPS position show up on that radio. Right? So they're very big. That big thing about Garmin is they will play nice with other manufacturers. It doesn't have to be all Garmin. And that makes your transition to Garmin easier because it's, you don't have to do a wholesale change. Right? You can keep your VHF radio. You can keep your autopilot and put a Garmin chart plotter in a radar. Right? So that's very important. We're going to delve into, as well, the large product selection. There's so much choice out there. Sometimes it's a little bit overwhelming. And that's why you know, some of us are here in front of you talking about it to make sense of all those choices. And lastly, what I like about it is the price point is right. You know, they're not more money than anybody else. If, uh, if anything, because they're built in Taiwan and they're not being hit by the tariffs, uh, they're actually less expensive than a lot of other choices. So you're not paying more for any of those things. The question is, and this is probably the number one, the number one thing that drives people to Garmin is they just want to use their product. I have voters that say, I want my wife to be able to use it without having to read a manual. My kids come on board. I want them to participate in the navigation. I don't want it to be too daunting. I don't want them to be just looking at a Navionics app because the, the chart plotter on our boat is too hard to understand. And so we've been doing wholesale changes on navigation systems where it's just too much of a learning curve and they just want people to use it. Because at the end of the day, if you're not using your navigation system, why do you have it, right? It's, got, it's meant to be used. All right, sort of a wide gamut of what's doing. We're going to be talking about most of these products. So Garmin, like other manufacturer, offers a wide selection of individual product types. Chart plotter, right, which some people are calling GPSs. They have that. Multifunctional display, same thing. Sonar, big part of it. Radar, autopilots. They'll do VHF, AIS, cameras, instruments. We're doing boats right now where we're actually digitally switching, actually turning lights and everything actually on the screens. Like for example, the Tactical 40 right now, when we worked on this project, you can actually turn on every circuit on that boat directly on the screens. So you've got digital switching built in. So they're playing nice with other manufacturers. Sea Zone's not owned by Garmin. Garmin's playing nice with another company, right? So that they can integrate. So those displays are a portal to whatever you want to do. Garmin bought out Navionics. We're going to be talking about that. Garmin owns Fusion. We'll be talking about that as well, right? So they do a lot of different things. And today I had someone in my booth, and they also integrate with FLIR. So you can basically do whatever you want with that navigation system, okay? So it's not, you're not being pigeonholed in any corner. So when you're thinking about an MFD, you know, you're going to be able to buy a chart plotter only from Garmin or an MFD. An MFD, you're going to hear me say that word a lot when we're talking about the different products. Basically, an MFD is sort of a portal to anything, right? You can see radar, you can see sounder, you can see cameras, whatever it is you want to do. It's like buying a TV and watching CNN or Fox. You can leave it on one channel if you want, or you can change the channel. An MFD is a portal to any sort of information that you have on your boat. Really exciting news. Um, and this is coming out in March. Navionics was acquired, like I said, by Garmin. And what they've done is they're releasing a new charting and they're blending Garmin blue charts and Navionics. And they actually spent through this whole process and they merged both vector charts together. 
two huge entities, the very best charting that came from both entities are now blended together in one software called G3. And that's being released in March. It's a very big deal. Very, very big deal. So now you're going to be able to have Navionics and blue charts all in one in this G3 release. The other thing that I want to highlight is you might have preconceptions on the screen size that you want on your boat, but what I would suggest is to look at a screen before you make a selection. Shopping online and imagining what a screen looks like can be deceiving. So when you're looking at a screen, make sure that you test it out, see it on a friend's boat, right? It doesn't matter. And I have a lot of boaters that sometimes go up or down, it depends. But see it in real life and visualize it so you can actually imagine what it's gonna be like on your boat. Garmin also does obviously buttons, touch screens, and they're doing also touch screen, and we're gonna be talking about that in the next slides, where they're actually putting some buttons on a touch screen. So you can actually have some favorites. So it's sort of like a hybrid. The other thing that's really nice is all pretty much all Garmin screens have Wi-Fi built in, and we're gonna talk about the benefits of that in relation to this Active Captain app, which again Garmin bought out. Active Captain is sort of Wikipedia for boaters. And I was describing it this morning to another boater. It's sort of, you know when we go, and this is the, beauty, the beautiful part about boating, the community. You know, it doesn't matter if you've got a 100-foot boat or a 15-foot boat. When we're on the water, we're all the same. And all boaters help each other. That community is one-on-one. -on -one. We're in an anchorage, helping each other out, solving problems for one another. Well, now that's been extended online to Active Captain, where boaters are actually literally updating charts, things that were missed, rocks that were missed when they did a survey. They're actually adding this information. Oh, by the way, this is not really here, it's over here. And as a chart plotter, you can actually enable this layer on top of your charts and say, I would like to see what the community has provided about this area as an additional layer, right? And so you can add that, and then it's peer reviewed, right? So all these different people are actually updating information, and you can use that to your advantage because not all things were captured by the surveys. And a vector chart or a raster chart is not reality. It's a perception of reality, right? And as a boater, if we're going farther and farther afield in smaller and tighter anchorages, not everything got charted perfectly. Certain rocks got missed. They're bigger than they thought. They're shallower than they thought. And so all this information gets shown on Active Captain. This is sort of what the G3 looks like. You'll see a lot more contours are coming out for fishing, for anchoring. So that's gonna be really exciting. Very, very exciting. I wanna talk a little bit about the nomenclature because we're gonna be going through all these products. There's this thing called the world base map. Base map is not a navigation. It's sort of the world is just in straight lines. You can't navigate with that. It gives you, you can see an island, but it could be off by a mile. So a base map is sort of a general topography of the world, but it does not provide any chart information. So either your Garmin device needs to have software built in for navigation, you can have G3, G2 built in, or you buy a chart card, right, for the area that you live in, and you have it on a little SD card that you put into your chart plotter. Not unlike what Raymarine or Simrad or Faroon are doing, right? So that's very important. We're going to be talking a lot about sounders, and this is a little bit confusing. <clears throat> Garmin uses two types of terminology, depending if you're looking at echo map or GPS map. So when you see the little acronym CV on a Garmin chart plotter, it means that it includes both clear view and traditional chirp. The first letter is actually, if it's better, it means it has that and everything beneath it. So for example, if you see SV, it's side view, clear view, and traditional chirp. And same thing about XS versus XSV. So an XSV is going to include both side view, clear view, and traditional. And we're going to be talking later about what does all that mean. But I just want to say there's different definitions for different products. This is the shorthand. Obviously, if you look at the brochure, they're going to spell it out. But if you're looking at just the product itself, they're abbreviating the products to have that nomenclature. So with that, we're going to start with the first chart plotter. 
And this is called an Echomat Plus. Uh, they come in basically three sizes, a six inch, seven inch, and a nine inch. If you don't need radar on your boat, right? Some of us won't go radar. This is a really good unit. Now, you can't get it in a big screen, right? There's nothing like a, you can't get a 16 inch version, but if you've got a sailboat or you've got a power boat and you don't want a 12 inch or a 14 inch or 16 inch and you're not gonna put radar, these devices are gonna provide a lot of bang for the buck. You can buy them with the ability to actually plug in a transducer in the back, which is really nice. In the past, five, 10 years ago, you had to buy a black box. You had to buy a black box, and that black box would then connect to the chart plotter. So it'd be that black box would do all the processing of how do you translate an echo coming from a transducer and display into an image. But like anything now, because everything's getting faster, they're able to build that capability into the device itself. So you can buy a, this Echo Map with actually either a CV, clear view and traditional, or side view, clear view and traditional. So you can literally see on the sides of your boat, underneath your boat, and a traditional sounder. Panoptics is this thing Garmin bought a company as well. You can see Garmin's buying a lot of company, right? They bought a company that did four scanning. So we've been installing on some boats where you're actually looking ahead of your boat not underneath your boat, but ahead of your boat. Depending on where you're going, like I've got owners, boaters that are doing the Queen Charlotte Islands, right? That's the real deal. It's real, right? Not everything is charted out there. The west side is uncharted, completely just white. There, they, there is no contours. So if you're going up there and you're going further afield, or you're a little bit more kind of gutsy where the anchorages you go to, then it might make sense to look at a forward scanning sounder. They do NME A2000, which is great, right? That's easy to integrate, sort of plug and play CAN bus. And they also do, and this is really important, and I want to emphasize this, Garmin is one of the few companies nowadays that are actually providing NME A018 ports. Manufacturers saying, oh, that's the past, who cares? Everything new in our product list doesn't do 0183, why would I support it? I would say you support it because I bought a VHF radio from you seven years ago, it's still great, and I need 0183 to get GPS. My autopilot, which is 10 years old, is awesome, and it only does 0183, and I want to integrate my autopilot with my chart plotter. So I know that your existing autopilot doesn't support 0183, but I'd like to have something that's backward compatible. And what's nice about Garmin, what they're doing here, is even on their budget series chart plotters, they're actually including that feature. So they're giving you an access to the past and an access to the future. So NME 2000 0183 makes your life really easy. You don't have to buy a converter, a device that translates between old English and new English. So that's really nice. But with this device here, you cannot do radar. Okay, so that's something you've gotta be aware. So this is why you're keeping the price point pretty low, is that you have no ability for radar. The other thing too, lastly on this slide I want to emphasize is the seven and nine inch are touch, but on the side you have a compressed menu for some quick buttons that you can engage the screen. It's not full control, but there's some favorites that you can put on the side. So that might be really great for a sailor, right? They want the convenience of touch three, four, five months in the summer, but sometimes they're boating in rough weather. They're sailing across, there's a spray hitting the screen, right? They're maybe on a beam sail, a broad reel, They've got spray coming into the cockpit, it's landing on the screen, and they want to be able to interface the screen in really bad weather, so that might be a way to do it. Okay, so it's a good compromise between the two. Yes, question? Yeah, so I, I gather these are weatherproof? Absolutely weatherproof. Even, I do on even big boats where we're doing these flagship series, right on the flybridge, it's raining hard, no problem. All of this stuff, you don't need a bimini, it could be out in the weather, absolutely. No problem. All right, here's an example of an Echo Map Plus 97 side view. So that means it does side scanning, which is really nice for fishing or anchoring. You know what's on either side of the boat. And it's going to see underneath the boat, and it's also going to see traditional. So here you're actually seeing the blue on the right hand side is actually on either side and on the top left is actually down beneath your boat and there's a little chart plotter. 
Now obviously, and this is the challenge, we have to be honest here. If you've got a nine inch screen and you're splitting it up in three, your squares are pretty tiny, right? And that's the advantage with a bigger screen. Once you get up to a 10 inch, a 12, a 16, a 22, a 24, you split that screen, it's still a big screen. But splitting up a nine inch screen into three parts, right? And as we grow older, our vision is not the same, so that's the challenge, right? Splitting up the screen is nice on here, but you gotta remember this is way bigger than what nine inch looks like in real life. This is probably the most popular device that we install on boats for electronics. And this is the 10,000, 12,000, or 1,200 series. The first numbers are tell you the size of the screen. So it's a 10 inch screen or 12 inch screen. And this is touch, not touch, I mean with buttons. Provides probably the best value, Garmin by far. I've done lots of boat where we'll put a 10 up above and a 10 down below or a 10, 12. And what's nice is they play nice. There's two network ports. And those two network ports are important because it allows you to connect one screen to one another screen so they can talk. So, and then you can have the radar come above and then that radar and then another port goes to the screen down below. And then if you had a sounder coming in, a pan optics, you can plug it. So it's sort of like a switch, right? Because the challenge is if you only have one port, then you actually have to buy a separate switch. Now Garmin sells that, but the great thing of having multiple ports is that you can start inter-networking your devices together. And that's important. Really good, and I've got both in the booth. Uh, Garmin has them too, and they're really nice. They look slick. They came out, I think, about a year or two years ago, and they're very popular. They're priced aggressively. It's not hard at all to get into that screen, okay, and change your electronics. So here's an example. This is a 12 inch for 12. 42 means built in charts. So the cartography, you don't have to buy the cartography separately, it's actually preloaded. And XSV stands for clear view, side view, and traditional. So you can actually, I'll come to you, you can actually see the bottom in all directions. And that's nice because what we're seeing a lot of days is I have boat owners that are saying, Jeff, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to haul out my boat in a year from now. Can I use my existing transducer, and it might be traditional, not chirp, on this device? And the answer is yes. I've got about a success ratio, about 90%, where I can do pin adapters, and Garmin came up with this black box, a little tiny one, that I'm actually able to convert a six pin to an eight pin, and I'm able to reuse an existing transducer on a boat, and they're saying, we're going to go to chirp later on, but my haul out is not planned for today or this summer, it's planned for a year from now. And we're like, no problem, we'll reuse your existing transducer today, and later on, a year from now, when you haul out, we'll put a new transducer, a chirp transducer, in your boat, and you'll get all the features from it. Question in the back. Um, will this come with the restart? Yeah, it will march, it will, absolutely. Yeah. Nope. Are there anything you buy at the boat show on special that have the restart? No, there's actually some of them. It's funny, I actually even bought some displays in January. I have G3. Yeah, yeah. You get software, you get ability to also update your software once a year. Talk to Garmin. They're, Garmin plays nice. Honestly, there's no funny business. There's no gimmicks, no tricks. None of this whole thing. There's no magic. It's just an honest company. If you do a good job in life, you get rewarded. You don't have to do anything. So they do the right thing. They don't have to put up barriers, right? They don't make it complicated. Everything's on the table. All right, so we talked about the 10 inch and 12, which I told you was really good value, right? The other one too that you've got to consider and really popular for most of us is going to be this line here, which is the seven inch, nine inch, and 12 inch touch. You're going to spend more money, of course, if you go with touch. Like a 12 touch is going to be at least 50% or a 10 touch is going to be probably 50% more than a non-touch. But what's really nice is that at least the 12 inch has two network ports, as opposed to the nine and seven. And that's a challenge. Like we've got some boats where, you know, the owner one day decided he's only gonna have radar in one screen. Then he decides, you know what? I want a screen of the lower helm. But the problem is there's only network, one network port, right? So when we put the lower screen and we already have radar, how do we integrate three things with only one port? You can't. So we end up having to buy a switch. 
So this is what I was talking about earlier. Look at your horizon. What are you going to be doing later on? If you're going to go with another screen on your boat, it might be worth looking at a device that gives you two network ports so that you can inter-network those devices. Now we talked about this a little bit earlier and I want to also something really nice is when you're looking at the GPS map, they come with built-in Wi-Fi. Now what does this mean? It means that you have the ability of looking at that screen and controlling that screen anywhere from your boat. So you can have the screen on your flybridge, be in the salon in the evening and it's blowing hard and you want to know what the boats in the anchorage are doing around you and you can literally look at your chart plotter on your iPad, have the radar overlay there and see if boats are actually dragging anchor. That is very convenient. Right? Because sometimes you might have a great anchor, you know what you're doing, but you've got to worry about other boaters that are new to boater and don't know better. It's not, they're not doing it maliciously. They just don't understand that sometimes the weather isn't always cooperating with us in the middle of the night. And that worries us as boaters. And so that's really nice thing about having a Wi-Fi built in where you can literally see your chart plotter and control it from anywhere around your boat. Question. Is that, is that a app? Your phone allows you to do that? Yes, that's right. And that's the Active Captain app. So we'll talk about that app. And it's free. It's awesome. All right. Uh, the next thing we're going to be talking about here's the GPS. And this is very confusing. Garmin has literally two of the same screen sizes. I know this because I made an error once. I ordered a GPS 1222 and it was supposed to be touch, and I didn't say the word touch. So when you're buying a 1222, you can buy a touch or non-touch, okay? So be very careful when you're looking or you're comparing prices, because there's gonna be a big difference between a touch version and a non-touch version. The next thing, and now is, this is what's called the flagship series for Garmin, is the 8000 series. It comes in either 8400 or 8600. 8600 is going to have charts preloaded. They come in literally six different sizes. Small as being 10 inch, 12, 16, 17, 22, and 24. If you're wondering in our booth, we've got the 10, the 16, the 17, and the 22 in our booth. There's certainly a wow factor on a 22, I'm not gonna lie, but you've gotta be able to swallow the price point. Most of us are gonna love it, we'll love it, it's awesome. But we're gonna stop ourselves and we're gonna go in the land of the reasonable. And the land of the reasonable is sort of around 12 and 16, and after that it's sort of like, you really gotta fall in love with the screen because it's really hard to, to, to swallow. The good thing about this device, again, it's got two network ports, which is great. NEA 2000, of course, 0183. The challenge is on the bigger screens, as you're going up to that 17, 22, and 24, is you cannot buy it with a sounder built in. Meaning that you're gonna need a black box, and we're gonna be talking to those black boxes. If you want a transducer and a sounder image to show up on that device, you're gonna need a black box separately. Those big displays do not have the capability of translating a transducer signal to a sounder image. Another device will have to do that. But if you're doing 10, 12, and 16, you can buy it with a sounder option built in or not. This is an example of an 8424. We did one boat where they literally had three, and then they had two 17s on the side. Now, mind you, it's a big boat. Lovely project, by the way. Lovely project. I, this is sort of I'm like, is this my dream? Am I, is this really why I went to engineering school? Because I'm like, pinch me. I'm like, this is awesome. It's like Star Trek. I love it. Okay, so obviously it's over the top, but sometimes we'll end up, and you can split those screens, but here's what I'm showing. On those boats, what ends up happening is some of us are actually putting C-zone, like we're digitally switching the boat. We're doing a boat where we're actually, all the AC that's ancient on the boat, turning the generators on and off, switching the generators, turning the power, inverters on and off, all of that is actually doing the digital switching. So instead of having a huge breaker panel and rewinding wires and everything, 
we're digitizing all this stuff and it's showing up on the displays. So now anywhere on the, they're even on the flybridge, they're able to turn and turn off and turn on the generators. So it's basically the future, right? Boats are being built like that today, right? Like Coastal Craft's been doing that for years. Tactical's doing that. Uh, Boston Whaler are doing that at the factory. Like this is gonna happen and it saves a lot on wiring and installation. It just makes it easier. So this Active Captain app is extremely exciting. Once, well, first of all, sort of like Navionics, a lot of us are familiar with Navionics. The ability to see charts anywhere is really nice, right? But what's even better for me than seeing charts is seeing what other fellow boaters in the community are sharing about any given location, right? Having an augmented reality around my boat and seeing, okay, where is this rock that I'm not familiar with this area, but I'm now in that area. Oh, look at that rock is actually not really where we think it is. So that's really nice. The other thing too, and Navionics had done that, and Garmin's been doing that for a while now too, is some people are really geeking out and actually using their sounder as their own device to create a bottom profile of the ocean. Then they're taking their information, uploading it to the cloud, and you can then take that information and have it show up on your app, and then you can have that information put to your chart plotter. So you can now start having a layer in an area and say, I'd like to see the active cap and community layer for this area that I'm unfamiliar with. Let me see what the bottom profile really looks. What did CHS or NOAA not catch, right? Because there's been a lot of boats everywhere. And if we collectively all pushed our information back into cloud, we'd have a pretty good understanding of what's happening in the bottom of the ocean. Simple syncing means that you can create routes, waypoints on your tablet, on an iPhone, and it's gonna push automatically to your Garmin. Updates from the app, what that means is you're gonna be able to actually literally, instead of having to worry to download something on a chart card, going to your boat and updating the software, you're gonna be able to update the software because your tablet's probably connected to the internet, your chart plotter isn't, but you're gonna be using your tablet as a broker to update all your software on your boat without having to do it online, bring on an SD card, and doing the software update. So it makes updating our software on our devices much easier. We also, and this is a big thing, you know, on some boats, you know, for example, sailboaters, there's really, are they really nowadays seeing chart plotters at the lower helm, at the nav station, like I was seeing in 05 and 2010? No, not that often. They're gonna spend their money on a chart plotter at the helm, and then where they're gonna use it is gonna use an iPad at the lower helm to be able to replicate that information. And not only replicate it, but control it, which is nice. Because sometimes, in the evening, maybe you're an anchor, you wanna know what's going on around your boat, but you don't want to always have to go outside. Maybe it's raining sideways, right? And you just don't wanna go out there. But you can literally now see it directly on your iPad. Garmin has also been a really big proponent of this thing called Sail Assist, which is sort of creating software for sailors. And so they're doing all these different things about how do you tack, where's virtual starting lines, time to burn, all these stuff that's kind of familiar and B&G's been doing for a while, right? B&G's really tailored to sailor. Garmin has reacted to that and created software. And if you change the profile of your boat, they're gonna actually enable that if you're a power boater, you won't see it, but if you say, I'm a sailboater, they're gonna give you all these options, which is nice. All right, so now we're gonna get into sonar. We can all think about depth, right? All of us should have a depth sounder, right? And that's a simple echo that can show up as a number on our boat, right? Just an echo. Over time, and Lawrence was certainly the first company to come up with this, you can, over time, if you're taking and recording all that information and interpreting it, you can actually start seeing a profile of what's happening under your boat. And those would be called fish finders, right? Sounders. Um, and even people that are into fishing would use it for anchoring. I want to know what the slope of the bottom is doing, right? And nowadays, now they're doing this thing called chirp. So instead of sending one frequency, they're sweeping across a spectrum of frequencies, listening and constantly changing that 
So they're getting way more information as opposed to only sending you know, 50 or 77 or 200. Now they're sweeping a, a broad spectrum. And that's been around for at least, we did votes in 2010, 2009. Low adoption back then, very expensive. But now chirp transducers are a dime a dozen. Airmar, Garmin, everybody makes them. And so that's a really nice way to see more bottom information. It's sort of like almost imaging of the bottom. This is what a typical fish finder looks like back in the day. So except the only difference here, it's powered by chirp as opposed to a 50, 200 or 77, right? So you're gonna get a lot more fish. But here's what's really interesting is now you can see, start seeing structures underneath. Like we use, for example, Clearview. You're literally, and this is looking under your boat at any given time. And it's literally showing you an image of what's underneath your boat. So for anchoring, it's really good to find rock ledges. You can actually see, you know, like I can see myself anchoring off of Jedediah between Bull, and you'll see literally the eel grass at the bottom or on the south part of Tribune Bay on Hornby, you're actually gonna be seeing eelgrass at the bottom. You'll know it's gonna be an indication of what sort of bottom you have, right? Or is it really rocky or is it really sandy? What sort of bottom do you have? Side view looks on either side of your boat. So as you're kind of doing twirls in a bay and you're looking at a place, because you might have 20 feet, 30 feet of water underneath you, but only 10 feet to your side is a rock ledge, right? So this would be a good way as you're stern anchoring or you're anchoring to know what's on either side of your boat. It's sweeping on either side. We use it all the time. Now fishing folks are gonna use that to find bait balls on either side of their boat, right? They're a couple hundred yards and then they're gonna go there. But even for boaters that aren't into fishing, I use it all the time for anchoring. So I really like that. We talked about how some of the Garmin devices have this capability built into the chart plotter, right? You plug in the transducer. If for whatever reason you have a black box, a display, Garmin display, that doesn't have the ability to plug in a transducer, you're gonna be able to buy black boxes that provide that capability aftermarket, right? So sort of like a separate device that does it. And they've got two right now, the GSD 25, they used to have the 24, the 25 and the 26. So we're selling a lot of the 25s. The 25 allows you to actually connect two transducers on this black box. So you can actually have two different transducers on your boat being processed by this device. And you'll notice the port in the middle, the one that looks like an ethernet, right? That's what it is. That Gar Garmin Marine network, that is how they're gonna be sending all this information over IP, which is internet, right? All the way to the chart plotter. Because it's a lot of video imaging. This is not done via Bluetooth, not done via Wi-Fi. It's actually transmitted over an Ethernet cable. So it's like computer to computer. That's what it is. The GSC 26 has been out for a while, and it does up to 3 kilowatt transducers, which is ridiculous. We did a boat back in 2010 that was doing 40 knots in house sound, and we were capturing the bottom in 2,000 feet of depth. So the sky's the limit, but so's the budget, right? I mean, anything's possible. You just have to be willing to sustain the price. <laughs> so in the land of the reasonable, most of us are gonna choose transducers that are 300 watts, 600 watts, and maybe a kilowatt, right? If you're really into fishing, you might go two and might go three, but that's extreme. Most of us are gonna do, think about a standard transducer for a sailboat that just gives you depth as a number. Right? That's generally going to be a 300 watt transducer. And most fish finders are probably around 600. And so some of the owners that I deal with that want to really have huge depth and they don't want to lose bottom at speed, then we might do a one kilowatt transducer. And we had a question, I'm going to talk about transducers. I'm just going to do briefly say that transducers, you can do them in haul, which is inside glue in, through haul, which is always better. And then you can also do them transom mount. By far the best choice is a through haul transducer. Number one, all the other items are convenience factors. It's like imagine talking through a wall or a door. 
you can hear someone on the other side, but it's really muffled sound. There's nothing better than being directly into the water. What we'll do is we'll install an in-haul transducer temporarily for a year, for two years. And they say one day when I haul out, because the haul out is expensive, I'll put a real transducer with a through haul. And I'm going to wait for a haul out to do that. So why would you do radar, right? Radar is the ability to see other boats in low visibility. It could be at night, it could be fog. It's line of sight only, of course. And the range will vary depending on the size of the array and also on the power of the array. This would be the boat is in the middle and it's actually overlaying the radar image on top of the charts. This is probably one of the top five things that people are getting new navigation for. It's a completely independent way of confirming your position. If your radar overlay aligns with your GPS, you know that both of them are finding your location independently of one another. If the two hands line up, you know where you are. If they're offset, you know that radar never lies. Radar always tells you the truth. And I've taken pictures on my boat where my GPS is off by 200 feet. And I do a radar overlay and you can clearly see it. You're like, this is crazy. I'm off by 200 feet. I'm practically on land with my boat and yet I'm right in the middle of the channel. So I use radar overlay all the time in nice weather because I want to practice, right? Practice makes perfect. And I want to be ready for the days when I'm going to be in a fog bank and swallowed in a fog bank. And no, I've never left the dock knowing there's fog, but I have sailed and been on the water when I'm engulfed by a fog bank. And if you haven't lived it, it's a terrifying experience. Utterly, utterly terrifying. It's like losing all your senses. It's almost like you're blind, deaf, you're, you just, you're, it's, it's unbelievable. Radar is a really handy thing to avoid that sense of completely knowing, being senseless. And the radar overlay is another added benefit. You can buy radars in two different sort of shapes. When you look at them from the outside, there's an array inside a ray dome, but on a small array, when it's only 18 inch or two feet, it's inside a ray dome. So we've got in our booth upstairs two ray domes. We've got an 18 inch ray dome and a 24 inch ray dome. Once the array goes bigger and it goes to three feet, four feet, six feet, eight feet, the ray dome would be too big and it's basically called a pedestal or an open array, not a ray dome. Different sizes. I want to emphasize Garmin came up with this Phantom radar, which is really, really, really neat. They do it both in ray dome and open array. What's incredible about the Phantom radar is that it has this call thing motion scope. So it's actually analyzing targets around your boat and will actually show them in different colors if the targets are moving towards you or away from you, which is really nice. It's sort of like MARPA, but without your involvement. So you don't have to acquire targets. It's actually looking at what tr targets have been doing in the past to predict where they're going potentially. And they're going to say, look at this target is actually coming towards you. I'm going to highlight in red or this target is moving away from you, I'm going to show you in blue, it's a safe target. You're going in different directions. And the other thing too that's neat is it actually does dual range. So it's going to show you targets in really close quarter and in far away at the same time. Traditional radar would never allow you to do that. You'd have to choose. Am I looking far, far away or am I looking near? Example, the blue, the, the, the target is moving away from your boat. Because it's really hard for all of us that aren't true mariners to make sense of radar. True mariners live and breathe with radar. That is their reality. In my family, we come from a commercial background, like big seagoing vessels. And everyone on the ship knows on, in the bridge, knows how to operate a radar. That's how they navigate. So to them, it's their reality. But to us that aren't using radar every day, what all of these innovations are doing is trying to make it more easier for us to understand so that the day that you are senseless and completely blind because of a fog bank, it's going to make it less stressful. And that's the purpose. Different sizes, like I was emphasizing here, the really popular ones for us are entry level 18 inches. 
and then entry level uh, Garmin radars, this open array. Of course we go bigger, there's no end, but with anything, the bigger you go, the higher the price point. AIS is not a gimmick. AIS stands for Automatic Identification System. I found out yesterday talking to another boater that in Sweden it's actually mandatory to have an AIS on board your boat. I feel the same way. AIS is a way for ship to ship to transmit their current location, their speed on ground, and their course on ground. And chart plotters will automatically tell you if you are on a collision course way before you figure it out that this boat is going to be on a collision course with, with your boat. And so you can start not predicting, but modifying your course to avoid collisions that are going to happen in three minutes, in five minutes, or in 15 minutes. Here in coastal waters, you can actually see almost over land. I light up AIS. I could be in Captain's Cove. I'll see boats in Howe Sound and in Victoria. Not Victoria, but on the other side of Active Pass. You can see boats. You're literally in the river, and you'll see all the boats light up in Burrard Inlet. There is no line of sight between Steveson and Burrard Inlet. I can guarantee you that. Radar will never show you a boat, but you'll actually see them lit up. Same thing, we've got a boat on the Sunshine Coast, and I'll see boats literally coming out of Vancouver Harbor and literally Nanaimo from the Sunshine Coast. So Garmin makes this AIS-800, uh, which is an AIS transponder receiver. Highly suggest people consider a transponder for their boat. Uh, what's nice about this one is it actually has a built-in GPS and has the ability to do an external. Every AIS transponder has to have its own GPS. Black and white, it's the rule. Some, in some occasions, it might make sense to not have an external, so it comes in with a built one. And it also has a splitter, which is really nice. Garmin has also started doing something which I agree completely with, is there's having all their VHF radios having built-in GPS. So now that DSC functionality on your radio, the distress signal call, that device that is basically like an effective 911 mayday, so other boats know your location, right? And if you've entered your MMSI, they know everything about your boat. The GPSs are built into those devices. And you can also buy them some with AIS receiver only. So if you're not willing to take the pill and go all out with a transponder, you can buy a GPS radio or VHF radio with GPS and an AIS receiver built in, take that information and I'll put it to your chart plotter, right? And you'll at least see AIS targets on your chart plotter. They don't see you, but you see them. This is really popular on a lot of boats where there's no place to mount a VHF radio directly on the, there's no place, the radios are too big. And so we'll end up doing black boxes VHF. If you've got an autopilot or looking at one, what Garmin is doing is they're doing two types, the compact reactor and the reactor. The reactor is really the one to go. The compact reactor is really for small boats. They say up to 28, but in reality, it's smaller than that. If you're looking at an autopilot, Garmin will play nice. They'll do hydraulic, mechanical, retrofit. They won't do wheel, though. They don't have a wheel one. Raymarine is pretty much the only one that has a wheel pilot. And the great thing about the Garmin system is the shadow drive capability, which means as soon as you grab the helm on your boat, it's going to sense that you grab the helm, and it's going to disable the autopilot while you're moving the helm. And as soon as you let go of the helm, it's going to regain control. So you don't have to disable your autopilot to grab the control of the helm. It's very intuitive. They have a smart pump which adjusts the flow so that it, you, it's not too tricky to choose an autopilot pump, which is nice. Here's an example of a compact reactor, and here's an example of a smart pump. And um, the other thing, too, I want to emphasize before I let everyone go here is that with, and this is all systems do this, but as the boats are getting bigger and bigger, we have a lot of what are called blind spots on our boats. We don't see all the points around. Like on my boat right now, no problem. I've got a 36-foot sailboat. But I was talking to an owner that had a 42 power boat, and there are certain places on their boat they can't see. 
So what's happening nowadays is you can literally see up to five cameras on your screen and you could say, I want to know when someone on, is disembarking the boat to dock it, I want to know when they're going to get off the starboard side. I don't have that, I don't see it. And maybe your partner's not always communicating or you don't hear them and you're like, are they off, are they on? Am I too far, am I too close? And you can actually see it with a camera. So we'll do cameras that are looking aft when you're towing a tender. I'm doing cameras in the engine room where they want to see infrared if something's happening and they've got an alarm. They can see if there's a fire. I've got cameras that we're putting them in salon because the grandkids are on board and they want to know that when they're on the flybridge and their grandkids are not answering, they want to know they're still in the salon. <laughs> so there's all these different things that you can do with cameras on boats and you can have them show directly right onto your screen. Also, obviously, Garmin does instruments, wirelessly and wired. And uh, what's really nice, they do two things to interface devices. They do this grid, which allows you to interoperate your device from remotely. Your screens might be far, but you want something close to you to operate it. So the tactical boat does that. And the other thing, too, is you can even do it wirelessly. Like RF, radio frequency, no infrared. And you can actually be standing away from your char plotter, maybe on your captain's seat, and you don't want to lean forward because the screens are too far. And you'll be able to operate your device directly with a wireless remote control. So with that, I'm going to say thank you for being here today. And if you've got questions, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be in the back taking questions about anything related to Garmin or anything else. So thank you, everyone, for being here. Much appreciated.